Today on Locked On A's, we are tearing up, not crying. Today we are putting A's players into tiers. We are ranking them according to their perceived value heading into what could very well be a very tearful offseason. So let's get into it, you guys. You are Locked On A's. Your daily Oakland A's podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. How's it going, A's fans? And welcome to episode 377 of the Locked On A's podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. I'm your host, noted baseball fan, Jason Burke. And on today's episode, we are ranking... All of the A's big name players into tiers and uh, seeing what kind of trade value they have. And I'm going to float some trade ideas for you guys as well. Um, Just like, hey, this is a team. This is basically what the A's would be looking at in return for a Matt Olson or a Matt Chapman or a slew of other players. That's what we're doing today. Is it a fun exercise? No, but will it be getting you guys ready for the offseason? Probably. Probably. So that's what we are doing on today's episode. Uh, But before we get into anything, thank you guys so much for making the Locked On A's your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. One of those platforms is YouTube. And if you guys are already watching on YouTube, and especially during this episode, comments could be very, very important. Make sure to comment your own trade ideas. Because uh, one thing that I love to do is just come up with trades and be like, oh, that's a good trade. That's a bad trade. And uh, because every now and then you're right, and then you can just flaunt it all over social media. So put yours in the comments down below. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Subscribe to the podcast wherever you like to hear podcasts. Follow us on social media at Locked on A's on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at ByJasonB on Twitter. If you guys have any questions for us, please send those to LockedOnAthletics at gmail.com. So, With a lot of uncertainty surrounding the A's this offseason and loads of speculation that they may be trading all of our favorite players away, I'm going to be putting the players you love into trade tiers. It's not going to be an enjoyable episode. I mean, if you like me, I'm the same, but the, the subject matter is not enjoyable, but it is probably going to be a pretty good primer for how we think things are going to be going this winter for the Oakland A's. So... Without further ado, let's get into tier one. And these are the guys with the most trade value based on what they do on the field and how much they are projected to make. So it's salary and production, and then also how long they're under team control. Team control is a big factor in a lot of these. So you'll you'll see some surprising names here in just one minute. And all of these values that I'm using here are from baseballtradevalues.com which is the website that people go to to just like, hey, this is what a trade could look like. I don't know. Uh, Are they the most accurate? Not necessarily, but are they, is it, am I using the same website for all of these? Yes. So whatever their system is for grading players, it's the same for every organization. And uh, you should be able to get a, a decent idea of how to gauge a return package for the A's. Am I going to use it as, oh, no, no, th- this guy's worth 40 value points and they're only getting 38. This is a bad trade. No, I'm not. It's not It's not actual rocket science. They, they, I assume, do not have actual rocket scientists on their staff making up this website. But uh, I, I trust them enough to give us a decent gauge as to what we're looking at here. So that is baseballtradevalues.com. It's a fun, it's a fun tool. So we're using that tool to get us our list today. And uh, you may be surprised by the top two guys on the list because they are not people that I generally mention when I mention trades. But when you consider how much team control the A's have left and how much talent they have, makes a lot of sense. So Sean Murphy is the A's most valuable asset. And I hate referring to him as an asset. Probably shouldn't have written that down. That's my bad. But he has a value of 652 I think it's out of 100. I'm not sure. No, it's not. It it could be more. It doesn't matter. 65.2. That's a good value. 
That, that's a, a very solid player that the A's have right there. And Murph is not a free agent until after the 2025 season. So that's 22, 23, 24, 20. That's four more years of control, including one pre-arbitration year. So he is going to be cost controlled for that first season as well. And that is why his value is so high. If the A's are cutting costs and more, more or less just tanking, for 2022 and probably 2023 as well, if we're being honest, would it be the worst thing to trade Murphy away and just let Austin Allen be the starter for 2022, at least to begin the season? Because you got Tyler Sorters from coming up the ranks. Hopefully he's the catcher of the future at this point, but we'll see. Would it be the worst thing to use your most valuable trade asset in a winter that is already going to be pretty dim? Why not trade Sean Murphy too? Because catchers generally have fairly short peaks, uh, at least offensively. You know, Buster Posey has trailed off a little bit. He was good for a little for the first half of 2021 after having all of 2020 off. So uh, he came back fresh. But most guys don't get to do that, and they can also get dinged up pretty easily. So you don't see long windows of the, the peak production guys. Like, uh, you know, Sean Murphy, pretty decent catcher as a defensive guy and at least serviceable at the very least. I think he's at least league, uh, league average offensively. So not bad. Trading Murphy may not be a bad play, if I'm being honest. And especially if this offseason is a full reset and not a retool like some of us are probably hoping. But if it's a full reset, trade everybody. I mean, just do as... Billy Bean said, and, and I used air quotes for the podcast people, um, as Billy Bean said in Moneyball, just give them three to the chest as opposed, or, you know, uh, just, you know, take them out, take them out easy as opposed to, you know, shooting them a bunch of times and loving them die slowly. Just make it easy for us. You know, like the uh, the Hudson and Mulder trades, those were like days apart. That was, that was fun. It wasn't fun. Let's let's keep going though. The reason that I'm uh, feeling this idea a little bit is because his value isn't too far behind Vladimir Guerrero Jr.'s value, uh, according to the site. So they use the same metrics for every player, and it's like ten points behind. But still, that's close. It's not a one for one. Obviously, that trade would never happen. But that is the kind of value that we are talking about that the A's could get back theoretically. That does not make sense logically, uh, but team control is a huge factor in these deals, and uh, that is why it could be in play, a, a high return for somebody like Sean Murphy. The Angels could offer somebody like a, a package, like Joe Adele and Brandon Marsh, two guys that are cornerstones of their future to pair up in the outfield with Mike Trout, and they have loads of team control remaining. I think they each got five years. And the value would not be as high as what Sean Murphy offers the A's. So do you make that trade if you're the A's? Do you get Joe Adele and Brandon Marsh in return for Sean Murphy? I think I would, probably. You get two guys that are outfielders. They'll probably hold up a little bit better. That's These are the kinds of questions that you have to ask as an A's fan these days. Uh, but moving on to number two on the list, and that is Ramon Laureano, who has a 60.5 value. That is roughly the value of the Adele Marsh package, just straight up. Again, it's all about team control when it comes to uh, Ramon Laureano. If the A's get an offer that is deemed fair for Ramon Laureano, uh, maybe they try moving him this winter since they'll be without him for most of April anyway. He's probably going to get traded at some point, so maybe he could be a trade target for a team like the Padres because Bob Melvin is now the, the manager of the Padres. I could see them making, you know, testing the waters on a trade. If I'm choosing a team that he would go to, it'd be the Padres. I think that they are in win now mode. They need, an out I don't know if they need an outfielder, but the outfielder that the A's have that would be a nice boost for any lineup uh, has a lot of familiarity with Bob Melvin. So I could see that come coming into play. Third on the list is catcher, um, prospect catcher, Tyler Soderstrom, who is not getting moved. So yeah, that's just not how rebuilds work. So He's not getting traded, but he's very, very valuable. I wanted to let you guys know that. So in fourth, we have Matt Olson coming off of an MVP caliber season. And because Yankees fans are so enamored with our current first baseman, uh, the trade would probably have to hurt them a little bit. Uh, the fans and probably the Yankees farm system. 
So the A's would be looking at either uh, their first or second top prospect, one of those two guys. Uh, and that's either Anthony Volpe, who is a 20 year old shortstop and the number 15 prospect in baseball, according to MLB pipeline or Jason Dominguez. Good name. Got two S's. I like the swag on that, uh, who is an 18 year old outfielder and is ranked number 17 in baseball. He is very, very highly thought of not a lot of tape to go on. Uh, He'll probably be a top five prospect as he matures and gets deeper into the minor leagues, uh, into double AA, A, triple A. He'll probably be a top five guy. So Jason Dominguez would not be a bad addition, I don't think. So one of those two, and then maybe Luis Gill. I think it's Gill. It might be Heel. Uh, doesn't matter. Luis Gill, who is a hard throwing starter that could join the A's rotation next season, and then maybe a couple of non or lower ranked guys in the Yankee system. And that would be a pretty decent trade package for Matt Olson. He's got two years of control. And then the last guy that we have up in tier one, and I, I, I didn't really do a, a, the ranking is weird. It's basically here are the highest value guys. And then it's everybody else who is in the double digits. And then tier three is everybody else. Single budget guys. So that, that is my ranking system. And it worked out. So there was a few guys in each. So there you go. Uh, last one up in tier one, though, is Frankie Montas. I keep telling you guys his value is at his highest right now. And that value is 39.6. That's pretty solid. Basically, every team in contention or that hopes to be in contention in 2022 could always use more starting pitching. And if Montas is available, he'd arguably be the best starter on the trade market, which could see a nice return for ace fans if he does get moved. Whoever put together the right mix of youth and talent to the A's liking could land themselves a new number one or number two starter. And Montas has a similar value to uh, highly touted Rays rookie Shane Baz. So if you like Shane Baz, that's basically who the A's could be go going and getting. It, it, you want We give us Shane Baz. We want Shane Baz now. He's a hard-throwing guy that walks guy sometimes throws hard from the left side that'd be nice and he is baseball's number 19 prospect so that would be a straight up close to one for one there might be some lower level guys that the A's could take a flyer on but something like that is what we'd be looking at in return for Frankie Montas so that's not bad maybe not one guy in the top 20 maybe they'd want to split it up and get two guys in the top 50 and do that instead and uh you know widen the net just a little bit uh, a team like the Giants could also be in play for Frankie Montas because they have a lot of starting uh, pitching hitting the free agent market. <clears throat> and they're also in contention and have a pretty decent farm system. They've got some guys that other teams would be looking at and be like, hey, I, I like that guy. Uh, something, and this is just me putting the numbers together on the website. Again, it's not rock and science, but I just followed the, the valuations of each of these guys and it matched up fairly closely. I think that the Giants may still be getting extra value out of this deal, but a package similar to uh, Joey Bart, and he could have replaced Sean Murphy as the A's everyday starter because uh, he doesn't necessarily have a path right now. You could have Joey Bart, Hunter Bishop, Seth Corey, who throws hard, strikes a lot of guys out, doesn't have a lot of control. And then Kyle Harrison uh, would be close to the value of Frankie Montas, but probably missing a piece or two. And that's a lot of decently talented guys. These are all top 10 prospects in the giant system uh, that, and I, I think that I'd have to do more research on each of these guys, but it's not a bad package. I got to say, and I could see the A's making a deal with the giants for one of their starters. If it came down to it, maybe the A's add in Piscotti or Andrews's contract to even things out a little bit. Uh, as opposed to getting another piece or two, maybe they just move on from Piscotti or Elvis Andrews and uh, they, they run out some of their, their own young guys. Maybe they bring up Logan Davidson to play uh, a little bit of shortstop or second base uh, and then just hand the reins to Nick Allen uh, at the beginning of the season as opposed to doing whatever to his, his time clock there. So that is tier one with some quick trade packages to give you a sense of the type of return that the A's could be looking at for some of their top valued players. Coming up, we're going over tier two, so stay locked in with Locked On A's, and I will be right back. 
We're back and better than ever. A new web interface for the start of the basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all basketball and football action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code LOCKED ON to receive your bonus. That is code LOCKED ON. That is all caps. One word, locked on. That that's what you type in, and then you get your fifty percent welcome bonus. And I gotta say, I know that the Blue Jays didn't win the AL East, but I like Bet Online. They they do a good they do a good job over there. And uh, you know, use code locked on, and you can also get a fifty percent bonus. Solid guys. Anyways, from basketball, football, the baseball postseason, which has one or two games left, we don't know. That's a uh, it's going to be exciting World Series fin finale there. Heading into November, you also got uh, the NHL, which is a traditional November sport. Uh, boxing and UFC, right down to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all of the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. And that's because bet online is where the game starts. All right. So as I said, tears and you know all all of this stuff is uh, it, it's an engaging time. So please engage with me down in the comments below. Uh, let me know what you think of some trade packages. I know that trading guys to the Giants is terrible, but it's going to be rough sledding. And if you if you hate the Giants, obviously you're not rooting for that. But if you can stand the Giants and you want to see somebody like Frankie Montas or Chris Bassett have a chance at maybe pitching deep into October because uh, if, if they're getting traded, they're not going to be with the A's. So it's not going to be with the A's. Uh, maybe that's something that you're interested in. Would, would that, would the giants be terrible? Uh, probably. Yeah. I still wouldn't like it, but they're easier to watch. They're on the local cable. So that's nice. I suppose trade everybody, the Padres or the, or the blue Jays. I like those teams for right now. I think. <laughs> Hmm. Well, let me know in the comments, uh, who are you trading out of those two out of those four guys? Who are you, your two out of those four? And what teams do you think would be a nice fit for those guys? And if you're a prospect person, let me know who you're looking at targeting in those farm systems as well. And then, uh, I'll, I'll definitely be commenting back and learning because, uh, when the A's are good, I, I look at the prospects a lot less. When they're bad, oh man, do I love prospects. I go to M, uh, MLB Pipeline all the time. So we're entering that phase of locked on A's. It'll be a lot of fun. But let's get back into this. <clears throat> One more sip. That's better. Welcome back to the Locked On Ace Podcast. If you guys are enjoying the show, make sure to hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts. Follow us on social media at Locked On A's on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at by Jason B on Twitter and in the Spotify Green Room app. If you guys have any questions for us, please send those to Locked On Athletics at gmail.com. Also, thank you guys so much for making Locked On A's your first listen each and every day. So for tier two, and these tiers are arbitrary. They're, they don't mean much. Uh, and I have to, I got to say, uh, for, for tier two, I'm taking guys whose values are still in the double digits. I said this briefly in the last segment, but it's all the, the, the top, the top guys are tier one. Everybody who's still in double digits is tier two. And then everybody else is tier three. So that's, th those are the tiers that's coming behind this, the fence just a little bit. So the top guy in tier two is Matt Chapman with a value of 24.1. He is an MVP caliber player. Is he going to get votes this year? Probably not. But he's an MVP caliber player, but has really struggled over the past two seasons, at least one of those due to injury back in 2020 and recovering from surgery in 2021. So have we seen the best of Matt Chapman? No. Is there still a lot of tread left on the tires? Is there still a lot of room for him to grow into the player that we have seen on a day in day, day in day out basis. Yes. So figuring out the value for a Matt Chapman trade is the trickiest part of trading Matt Chapman. And I've mentioned this before, but one player that I could potentially see staying 
in Oakland in 2022 is Chapman. And not because the A's wouldn't move him, but because the front office could not get offers close to their asking price, which should be closer to his potential value as opposed to what he's done the last couple of seasons, I think. So that that should be his trade value should be higher than where he's valued currently coming off of that that season that he had last year where he hit like 220 and struck out so many times over 200 times what, what did he finish at 201 that's a lot of strikeouts oakland record going down the history books maddie chapman but uh it's basically a matter of finding somebody who will make meet you in the middle right there with the ace per c value and what he's actually given. You got to meet in the middle right there. And that's going to be the key to making a deal for Matt Chapman. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. I know that uh, Locked On Mets host Ryan Finkelstein has floated a name. And that person's value is higher on this website than Matt Chapman's. And he said, and more. So I think that if the Mets are serious, I would do that deal. If he if he is a representative for the Mets, I make that deal. We'll definitely, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that we're talking on Thursday. So that would be Friday's episode. And uh, hopefully that happens. If not, I'll spill the beans. If it falls apart, I will spill the beans later on. But uh, we, we may have a Matt, Trapman, Matt Chapman trade episode for you guys coming up to finish out the week and get you ready for the weekend. Uh, you get an extra hour of sleep. So we're trading Matt Chapman uh, on the podcast to end out the work week. Uh, so you, you want to find a trade partner for Matt Chapman that could thread the needle between what Chapman has been the last two years and what his ceiling still is. That is what I'm getting at here and offer a package around that value, not what he is currently and what we think he's going to be, but right around that middle ground, the Mets would be a team that would have some interest uh, and their number two prospect, Brett Beatty, hmm, but I, I spelled the beans already. <laughs> it's Brett Mayday. That's that's the guy that we're going to be talking about. Could be a name that would be thrown around just a little bit. Beatty is a 21-year-old lefty and is Pipeline's number 45 prospect in baseball. Uh, he looks solid. He looks pretty good. And he could take over the starting third base position in 2023. Maybe he's... I mean, I don't know if he's like the answer at third, but if he can play competent third base i'll take it nobody's gonna play matt chapman third base not even he's the best nobody's gonna do that so can they get a lot more offense out of somebody maybe that's how you 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 thread that needle in replacing that production is getting somebody who has a bigger bat or a better hit tool than matt chapman and so Beatty plus a couple of pieces could do it or the A's could go after four to five guys with slightly lesser talent to build up some of their, their farm depth. That's another needle that the A's will have to thread if they start making trades uh, is whether they throw all of their eggs in on a few top end guys and just stock up on top 100 prospects or they build up some of that, uh, some solid depth with a little bit lower of a ceiling, maybe back end top 100 guys and uh, build up their depth and try to create, you know, a full 40 man roster. And they're not going to get 40 guys in these trades. And depending on how many guys, how many trades they make, they're not going to get 40, but you fill up, I don't know, 20, 20 of those. And maybe two of those guys are your main cogs. And then you got 18 other guys. You're like, yeah, this is the new Steven Biscotti or the new Chad Pinder or whoever. Maybe that's how they're going to go about it. But uh, moving on, next up on the list is Sean Manaya, who has one year of control left and a value of 18.5. And for some reason, I'm getting very distinct Toronto Blue Jays vibes here because they need some solid starting pitching depth and Manaya would be a nice fit for the club. Uh, it's probably shooting a little bit too high because uh, the values don't match up. Again, not rocket science, but Jordan Groshans has a similar value to Sean Manaya, and he is their number three prospect. Uh, I'm not sure if the A's would necessarily want to do a one-for-one -one trade for a piece like this. Maybe they'd want to get three six value guys for Sean Manaya. So they spread it out a little bit, but maybe you go get one 20 value guy like Jordan Groshans and uh, go with that. But this would not be a terrible move. I would not mind seeing Sean Manaya in Blue Jays colors. 
I think he'd pull it off. He'd look really good. Uh, the Jays would get another starter, and we all know that they're going to be busy this offseason trying to break into the 2022 postseason. So you can kind of pencil the Jays in and as in on a lot of these trade talks. Uh, whether or not they get any of these guys, if the A's end up making trades, that's to be seen. But they'll definitely be talking to the A's on a number of these players. The final player of tier two, and this is a this is a rough one because uh, he's become one of my favorite players. He, I know that he's uh, one of my Spotify green room uh, listeners or callers, uh, people that joins me on Spotify green room. He is uh, one of their favorite players, and that is Chris Bassett. And I am surprised that he is so low. Uh, it, he has a value here of 14.5. And maybe it's because he's only done it for, you know, a season and a half of full season ball. But uh, he's been really good. His value is higher than that, I think. Uh, I don't have a team for you with Chris Bassett, but I will say this about potential negotiations. Uh, each team would have their main piece in a potential package or the package that the deal is built around. Every team's going to have one of those. And those guys will play a role in trade negotiations, obviously, because that's how trades go. But the determining factor here could be which team adds a wild card prospect as well. Maybe it's a hard throwing righty uh, that, you know, just had Tommy John coming off of surgery or something like that. Or it's somebody with great tools that can't stay healthy or a pitcher with crazy movement that just can't find the zone. A, a prospect that the A's think that they can turn into a, a pretty good big leaguer. That's That could be the determining factor here is uh, one of those guys, I think, in order to land themselves Chris Bassett. Because Chris Bassett, uh, he, he's really good. We, we saw him the last uh, you know 2020 and 2021 be one of the best pitchers in baseball. He's arguably Garrett Cole without sticky stuff. And uh, he's got the heart of a lion. So if Chris Bassett goes somewhere, I want him to be happy. I want him to be on a good team that I don't hate. And I want the A's to get really, really good prospects in return. Uh, Bassett has been outstanding the past two seasons and has shown what he is all about. I think that teams would jump, absolutely jump at the chance to move some of their future talent for one year of CMAS. So coming up, we are talking about tier three. So stay locked in with Locked On A's and I will be right back. And for you two people, this is where I, I just do digital inserts. That's a new thing uh, It for you. I usually have uh, ad reads. Today, I'm just going to put them in for the podcast, people. And we're just going to keep going. I'm going to take a sip of this. and But again, leave comments below. Now that you know tiers one and two, let me know in the comments, who are you trading? Who do you think that they may end up at? And uh, if you're right, I will definitely shout you out either on the podcast or on Twitter. Let me know, I guess. You know, I would like a Twitter shout out or I would like a YouTube shout out or let me know what you want. So uh, let me know in the comments where guys are going, what you're what you're eyeing in return, and uh, we'll have some fun. Also, subscribe. <laughs> Welcome back to the Locked On Ace Podcast. If you guys are enjoying the show, make sure to hit subscribe. Leave us a rating and a review if you can. Also, make sure to follow us on social media at Locked On A's on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at by Jason B on Twitter. And if you guys have any questions for us, please send those to LockedOnAthletics at gmail.com. So most of the players that would bring back system building returns are in tiers one and two. But there are a couple of players here in tier three that could net a nice player for the next A's contending teams. The top of tier three belongs to someone I don't think they're going to move on from, that they're not going to trade. And that is James Caprillion, who has a value of 7.5. He was a high draft pick. He was traded to the A's from the Yankees back in 2016 in the Sunny Gray deal. And uh, yeah, he, he stayed healthy in 2021. He was pretty, he was pretty good until I think he ran out of a little bit of gas there. Uh, coming off the short season, and also he's never pitched that much. Um, so I think that he ran out of a little, little bit of gas, but I think that he is a nice guy to have for the next couple of seasons at the very least. Uh, the main reason I don't think that they'd move on from him just yet is because he isn't a free agent until after the 2026 season. That's five years of control, you guys. The reason he could be on the move, though, 
it's because of his injury history. He stayed healthy in 2021. Maybe the A's are similar to Frankie Montas. Maybe they're like, I don't know that I want to roll a die on him being healthy another season and capitalizing on th- on him being healthy. Then let's let's take the bird in the hand now, as opposed to two in the bush. And uh, the front office may be wanting to capitalize on that fa- fairly healthy season and turn it into younger guys is kind of what I'm thinking there. The potential returns wouldn't be terribly big. They wouldn't be, oh man, we just got this number 15 prospect in baseball. It wouldn't be anything like that. But maybe they could convince a team that, you know, one of their top 10 prospects, depending on how good their farm system is, maybe it's something like that. And then maybe a couple of other guys that are, you know, older, that could be okay. Maybe like a 25 year old prospect that you know, just hasn't, doesn't have room. Maybe it, it's somebody that they would cut from their 40 man roster ahead of the rule five draft. And the A's are like, yeah, we like that guy. We'll give him a shot. Maybe it's something like that. Um, but basically any team that could be involved because of uh, any team can be involved in these trades. So the Baltimore Orioles are now in discussion. They, they could be part of this trade package because he's got five years of control. The Orioles have to start winning at some point. So he would definitely fit their window in some regard. And it could also present the A's a chance to reset with somebody a little bit younger. So Cap will be in his age 28 season next year in 2022. So grabbing a 21 or 22 year old may be something that Oakland is interested in since the wins and losses won't necessarily matter in 2022. So maybe they just want to reset on getting another pitcher that's you know 21 or 22, maybe 23, and uh, seeing if they can Re- rework that a little bit, especially with his injury history. That's that's the reason that I could see him getting moved, but I think that he's somebody that the A's will keep, but let's move on anyways. Uh, behind him is Cole Irvin, who has a 5.1 trade value, and now I've mentioned the entire starting rotation that the A's could potentially trade just because they have decent value and they had a pretty good rotation in 2021. I don't think that Irvin is going anywhere either, but uh, he would make a great addition to the Seattle Mariners, the only team that he struggled against. Take out the games against the Mariners, and I believe that he had a zero ERA the rest of the season. So if he's on the Mariners, nobody else could figure him out. So obviously, set him in Seattle, he'd be a great starting pitcher there. Um, I don't know that they want him in the clubhouse, but I think... They, they're probably fine. It's probably water under the bridge right now. But uh, I, I think that they could be in play if the A's are okay with sending somebody within the division. I could definitely see the Mariners pick, trying to pick up one of the A's starters or maybe a, a reliever that I'll mention here in a second. But uh, that, you know, we'll see. Um, after Irvin, we have three players in the three value range in Tony Kemp, Seth Brown, and Dalton Jeffries. Uh, I'm... Also pretty sure that all three will be on the team next season, uh, mostly because two of them are making the major league minimum, minimum, and I think Tony Kemp's projected for a $2 million salary, so you got to pay somebody, (laughs) and I like Tony Kemp. He's fun, so I I think that all three of them will be there, uh, unless one of them probably, if one of them was added to the deal, it would probably be Tony Kemp because he's versatile and solid and is a nice bench bat. Uh, one, maybe one of them is added to a deal with one of the tier one or two tier two guys. But otherwise I see all three of these guys being on the team in 2022. Uh, Jeffries and Brown have a lot of room to grow. Dalton Jeffries hasn't really gotten much of a chance in Oakland. Uh, Seth Brown, I talked about it right when the season ended. He could be solid. He His power is legit. It's Matt Olson level power. Can he do everything else is the main question. So I think the 2022 is going to be a big proving year for Seth Brown, but I'm intrigued to watch him. He's pretty good defensively. Can he hit a little bit better and not strike out so much and maybe hit against lefties every now and then? Those are the questions. We'll find out. But he's got power, and uh, I like that about him. Uh, rounding out Tier 3 are Logan Davidson, who is also not getting traded because he hasn't made his debut yet, and Lou Trevino, uh, who is another guy that could be wanted by basically any contending team because any contending team always needs bullpen help. 
That's just a rule of baseball. Uh, he wouldn't have to close it basically wherever he went because most teams have closers. And But he does have closing experience, and he's a pretty solid depth option, honestly. Uh, plus, he has three years of team control left, which is enticing to other teams. And for the A's, bullpen arms are volatile, but they always seem to find them wherever they get them. So Lou Trevino wouldn't be a, a big loss, I don't think. His valuation is only 1.1, but I think that the A's could get something like a five value for him, mainly because of the years remaining. Um, maybe teams don't want to pay a, a five value, which, you know, is an okay prospect. It's probably like a 15th rank prospect in somebody's farm system. Maybe they don't want to pay that, but eh, if you're going for it, Lou Trevino, not a bad addition. Uh, so if you pair like Lou Trevino and Chamanaya and ship them both to Toronto, uh, I think that that would make a lot of sense because they could use all of the pitching and, uh, Hey, why not? And maybe you can get a little bit better prospect package in that deal than you would have gotten for either of them by themselves. Oh, well, obviously Trevino by, by himself, but, uh, then you would have gotten for just Chamanaya. So, Maybe that's something that the A's do. So those are the tiers that I came up with based on the values that were presented by baseballtradevalues.com. Uh, I don't think that everyone listed here will be moved, but I wouldn't be surprised if like four or five of these guys are gone, like quick. Maybe before the CBA runs out at the beginning of December. Maybe they're all traded in November uh, before we even find out if there's going to be a salary floor or anything that could keep them on the A's, and then they just adjust course from there and sign up free agents just because they need to pay guys a certain amount of money. But I think that they're going to, they, they know which direction they're going in. And if that direction is trading everybody, we should probably see it before too long, before there is a potential uh, lockout and uh, they, they can't. So I think that it, if things are going to happen, it's probably going to happen this month. Uh, the front office's goal main goal if they do not and if they do end up trading guys is basically to start rebuilding the farm system and just rebuilding the Oakland A's from there the A's will be looking for bargains on the free agent market for guys that they could see turning into a nice trade piece at the deadline too I mentioned I believe Corey Dickerson yesterday it's him like Randall Gritchick I I get them confused it's one of those guys they're usually like a one or a two war player one of those, I, one of them is a free agent. One of them's fine. They're both fine, but uh, guys like that, you know, the next Billy Butler, but only with trade value. <laughs> uh, in 2022, they, they would probably get somebody like Frank Schwindel, but then hold on to him and not just straight up releasing him and then see him do really, really well for the Cubs. Th these are the kinds of moves that I could see the A's making this off season uh, outside of trading all of our beloved players that we've fallen in love with the last few seasons. The upcoming season will probably be uh, just about taking chances on guys. So if you see a once highly valued prospect get released or not make the 40 man roster or something like that, they may end up in Oakland. That is the cycle that we are in right now. Last week, I started getting ready for a just a regular rule five draft by explaining how the rule five draft works. If you missed it, great episode, check it out. But some some of the moves uh, of the many, many moves that could be happening are probably going to be freeing up a lot more 40-man roster spots. And so the A's current prospects will probably be anybody that they think may have value. Maybe that makes room for, uh, what's his face, Austin Beck. Um, if they think that he can turn it around, then he's going to have a good, and he's had a good Arizona Fall League at that point. Maybe they end up keeping him and using him uh, as a potential piece for their for themselves uh, coming up in you know two or three years because they're they're resetting. Uh, it's a good time. So they may be more active in the Rule Five draft than they would have been just last week because now with Bob Melvin gone, it kind of signals the direction that the team is going. But just a few days ago, we were looking at a potential roster crunch. Now we're looking at trying to fill out a forty man roster with talented guys and uh, give us a little bit of hope. Uh, that hope's not going to be here for a minute, but we're going to be deep diving into everything every single day. It's going to be a lot of fun. The A's are going to be active this winter, and I'm going to be here with you guys every step of the way. 
breaking everything down, getting to know a lot of new faces. So uh, make sure to subscribe to the Locked On A's podcast on YouTube or wherever you like to hear podcasts. And also thank you guys so much again for making the Locked On A's your first lesson of the day. Now go make Locked On MLB your second lesson. Sully's going to be talking about the World Series heading back to Houston. So you're not going to want to miss that. But that's it for me today, you guys. So until next time, go out and celebrate good times, Oakland. And I will talk at you tomorrow. <laughs>